Hey everyone, so we're going to look at 10 things that just make you go, hmm? So in a previous video, I actually talked about five scenes that were done very well. I mean, Arcane has a lot of good character moments. You, you got moments that, you know, just make you go, wow, that's, that was a great scene. You know, good fight scenes. You, you got scenes that are really heartwarming and there are wonderful lessons that come out of it. And then there's some that just to just like rip your heart out, just tear it up and throw it in the into the garbage disposal. It's like, wow, situation. But given that, no one's perfect, and there are going to be things that kind of fall through the cracks. And in fact, since Arcane is told in nine episodes, sometimes it's just because, you know, there's not enough time to talk about everything. But other times it's like, what? Why is this, like, here? I don't get it. So we're going to look at basically 10 things, or actually a lot of other things uh, that are interesting. But I just want to, I made it down to 10, and we're going to look at these bit by bits. But if you ever have something that just makes you go, huh? Or you, you find an interesting scene uh, from Arcane, definitely uh, leave it in the comments. So let's start off one by bit. So first off is Echo. And this is the kid that just will not die. When you think about this, it's like starting from episode 4. So episode 4, Echo just like goes straight at Jinx who has a Gatling gun, and somehow managed that unscathed, managed, even though Jinx is shooting at his hoverboard, he somehow gets away with hardly a scratch, which is kind of odd from my point of view. Now, of course, I'm not, I'm not saying he's like got a mask, so you don't even know that it's him, but it, it, after about episode 7, it's, it's fairly clear. And then, of course, in episode 7, Echo fights Jinx again, and this somehow he gets away from the explosion that Jinx rolls out. And so he would probably would have had to have jumped off the bridge, somehow avoid getting, you know, killed by the fall. The kind of, kind of, you know, the, the hoverboard sort of saved him, but not exactly because it's broken situation. So it's, it's kind of it's kind of odd how he survived that. You, you would think, considering all the stuff that has happened, he probably would have been dead. But again, because of the, because of the basically time, because of storytelling, it's it's not very it's not clear. Me me, this is kind of a guy that has a little bit of plot armor. Now, what's also interesting that's going on here, and this is just just not addressed because there's no time. This was probably not. The first time. It's not the second time. There just seems to be like a little bit of bad blood between the two. Because, okay, if you think about this, they at least encountered each other in episode four. And definitely in this time. And Echo is convinced that Jinx is like totally gone. So there's been some interaction between these, between these two during the time that was episode three and episode four. And that could be a whole set of very interesting stories that I would, I would love to hear about. Then there's another thing that just was not mentioned, but you really wonder about. And that is the girl with the hood. So in episode four, and Echo just really goes right at Jinx because uh, Jinx has killed this girl. And this girl kind of seemed to look like Vi. So that just like put... Jinx in total panic mode there and just killed her. And because of that, Echo just did not like. He said, no, and just went after her. So it's like, what was the relationship here? Was she like his girlfriend or, or something? What, what, what was going on? And we never find out. We don't ever find out the person's name. We don't know what the relationship is. You would think he would have said something to Vi or Caitlin or somebody. We don't know. And probably because of time, that was left on the cutting room floor. But it would have been nice to know. Then, <laughs> there is this odd behavior. So, Jace gives the, basically, peace agreement. And, obviously, the council members object. You know, they get up and they scream and they shout and stuff. You see that scene. And, you know, from, from their perspective, it's kind of easy to understand. I mean, you have a, a rebellious section of the city you probably have a piece that you want to keep. I mean, if if you're rulers, you don't really like places declaring their independence. I mean, that's not something that you really want. Except that somehow, 
at the end of this, you know, Mel says, you know, I'm, I'm in favor of, of this thing. So let's do it. And they're like calm and sort of, you know, oh, oh, okay. So what happened? And it's, it's almost like, you know, Jace looks, looks at Mel and is like, yeah, we did it. And he's like, what did you do? There seems to be a lot of hand waving around this. It's like, because I don't quite understand how Jace would get the council on board if they seem to be so against the whole idea. And, you know, he's like, well, you know, I'm going to quit or something. And they could have, like, there's, there's more them than him. And they could say, screw you. I mean, there's, there's no, how should I say, real clear evidence of, you know, who's who and what do they want and how this actually worked out. It's just so odd, especially since there was, you know, Silco never really signaled that he was okay with that because <laughs> it goes like, well, I have to turn Jinx over. Oh, that's going to be a great situation. So it's like, why did this happen? It it just seems so odd that that it worked this way, which of course then brings us to Heimerdinger, who was of course thrown off the council, but this guy is like uh, so unaware that it just does not make sense to me. So when you when you think about this, Heimerdinger was the founder of the city, so he's been with these people for two hundred years. Now of course you can say okay. So he's more than 300 years old. He has a different concept of time compared to like most normal human beings. So that he, he could be unaware or uncaring in that way. But it's like he's been with human beings for at least 200 years, maybe more. And he could probably have an idea of the different personalities on the council. I mean, he, he's probably seen people come and people go and that sort of thing. And you might say, okay, but this guy, you know, he's a scientist. He's interested, you know, in science and research and stuff like that. So he's probably like paid little attention to uh, what the goings on in the council. But he's the guy. He's like been in every council meeting, so he's got to have some awareness. And another odd thing is, is that it almost seems like he's been to the Undercity for the first time. It's like, oh, so this this is what's going on. It's like. This guy's been since the founding of the city. You would think that he would go out and, at least for curiosity's sake, you know, see what's going on over there. And apparently not. It's like, huh? <laughs> no one is that unaware, are they? It's like, this is just so, so curious. It's, it's kind of it's like, they're not going to paint the picture where all of a sudden, you know, he talks with Echo and then has an epiphany and like, okay, everything in Zon is like uh, crappy and I need to do something about it. So let, let's work together and do some stuff. It's like, I can't imagine that someone who's been so unaware for 200 years is suddenly going to get any kind of awareness of all the stuff that uh, he did wrong by just n not <laughs> thinking about things. <laughs> he should be aware of that, what people have have a concept of time. I mean, he's been around with people 200 years. He's been around in this city for 200 years. He should, he should know how things work. It's just so odd. But anyway, and that brings us to Mel. So when, when you're looking at all the scenes with Mel, y you get a good strong feeling that she knows how to operate politically and there seems to be a lot of corruption going on. So if you look at it, it's like obviously the bearded guy and the kind of the effete dandy guy are like incompetent idi idiots or something like that. And the other two people are kind of iffy. And, you know, there's a patrician lady who, I don't know, she has a clue whatsoever. So it's like, you know, someone like Mel, at least she seems to know how to play the game, play it well enough that, you know, she can teach Jace a thing or two. And she knows, you know, the right strings to pull and stuff. So, like, why isn't she in charge? Why did she let... He I mean, obviously, she let Heimerdinger because there's no one else uh, to be in charge. But it's like, figuratively speaking, she would, like, like, be the person behind everything and could just kind of manipulate everyone to do whatever she wanted. So, you would think that she'd be the, the real power behind the throne, so to speak. Especially when you learn out that, you know, she was a daughter from from Noxus, and obviously those people know how to, you know, it's not just about, you know, power, there's a lot of that, 
but probably a lot of intrigue that went on there <laughs> when she was growing up. So she should be able to control everything. And apparently she doesn't. And you would think that she would have probably tentacles everywhere and, and know enough what's going on in the Undercity as well and what's going on with Silco and everything. But it's like, she doesn't. And it makes you wonder, like, what is she after anyway? It's not sure. There's, there's not enough there there that to really figure out why she needed Jace in the first place and why she wanted Jace to take over. And she could have easily done it. I mean, maybe she didn't want to be on top. It just seemed to be safer. Who knows? It, it's very hard to figure out what she's really after, if she's really after anything at all. Very odd. Then there is, of course, the whole grand conspiracy. Or at least that's what Jace calls it. So, Caitlyn is interesting in that, you know, apparently she's a good shot. And she was really interested in shooting and apparently this thing. So, what got her interested in all of this? I mean, you know, there's no clue here. So we need to look at her family, like her father doesn't seem to be someone who's working for the police. Grayson seems to be not even a family friend. So it's kind of hard to figure out what the, the relationship between Grayson and her. I mean, you see a scene where Grayson kind of held back, but that doesn't mean that, you know, the question like, well, what are you shooting for? It's like, okay, why are you interested in shooting in the first place? We don't know. And was Was that the thing that triggered her to want to join the enforcers if so then why would she be like so incredibly obsessed about finding out the answer to who is controlling you know all the crime that's going on in you know the city of piltover what's the deal here with this obsession you you would think there'd be something that that's going on uh, but you have no clue again they don't have enough time to flesh this out but there, there's this but there's this aspect of Caitlin's personality that probably drove her to be so interested in being a good marksman and, and to go joining the enforcers and three just being like so incredibly engrossed in trying to figure out what the truth is and we never find that out it, it was not it was not a core part of the story but maybe maybe in the next season we'll learn more about that then there's of course Jace is a fighter so we're I was like, wondering, we never get any scenes where Jace is practicing whatsoever. I mean, a lot of the other people who are decent fighters, you can kind of figure out why they're decent fighters. I mean, the whole series, especially with respect to Vi and Jinx, is like it's a fairly clear setup from, from the very beginning. Uh, where these characters are going to go, what's their strengths and weaknesses. I mean, Vi is someone who, who you know, is not like a brawler. Uh, as far as you know physique is concerned but you know worked at it a lot <laughs> to be to become really good you know practiced on the boxing machine almost probably every day considering the score she really really got better and so it seems very natural especially in this particular situation that she would be good enough i mean she's gotten a lot of fights that you can kind of see that she's got good enough reflexes to take care of the situation but jace like comes out of nowhere it was like where'd the weapon come from well, maybe he was building it we never see any clues of that, but we kind of, you could probably figure it out. And it's like, well, he, he's building a thing in the forge, and maybe he, he just made this thing. The gloves were at least shown. <laughs> they were shown in episode four. It's like, these things didn't just come out of the air, but the hammer did, and Jace's fighting ability just seemed to come out of nowhere. So it was like kind of a mystery. And then you got Savika. So Savika is kind of... You know, kind of a question mark here in that why is she so loyal to Silco? Now, this one is this is one of those things that you could sort of figure it out if you really think about it. But I mean, the thing is kind of set up so that you know she first basically gave up on Vander because you know Vander was not doing things right. He wasn't really standing up to the people, and you see Savika basically, you know, complain to Silco about Jinx and about how he's handling things and so on and so forth. So you, you could you could see that there could be elements in place where she might just betray Silco for another person, but she doesn't. And you're like, well, why? Why, why is that? I mean, it's like, hey, she didn't. Oh, cool. I mean, there's a payoff there, 
but it's, it's not clearly explained what her motivation is in the first place. You kind of want to know that, but again, for time, it's not like there's enough time to get into that now. Maybe, maybe next season. Maybe we'll learn about what she's really after. I mean, there's a whole thing about the father-daughter relationship. So there's, there's probably some dynamic of that going on there, maybe. But again, probably season two, maybe I'll mention it. Then there's the whole scene between Silco and Banner's statue, which in another video I mentioned in a wonderful, wonderful scene here. And, you know, initially I kind of thought, okay, if Silco was in charge, there would be no good reason for this statue to exist because, you know, he hates Vander, he thinks he's a coward, a, someone who betrayed, you know, everything. And, you know, if that's the kind of story that he was going to use to his advantage to extend his power, it'd be very odd the statue exists in the first place. Or at least, you know, considering Silco is in charge, he probably would make, he'd destroy the statue if it existed. Now, there is kind of a reason, you know, I kind of, think there is one explanation that sort of fits the facts. Which, of course, I mentioned in, in another video, but uh, that sort of makes sense. But again, it's not really explained here. And I, this is probably like, there's not enough time, we couldn't get into it. But it looks cool from a visual standpoint, so here it is. Then there is the whole situation with Zon. Now, if you've ever played the game, you're like, well, you know, there's a place, it's called Zon, it, it's, it exists. But in the show Arcane, it doesn't exactly exist. I mean, basically Silco mentions it in episode 3. You know, the nation of Zon. But there is no other character that mentions that name unless they came in contact with Silco. So you do see it mentioned that... Vi says that Zon refer that Silco refers to Zon, and you also hear that Jace talk about Victor's a Zonite, but that's only after there's been a peace treaty. So it's like, oh, that's kind of odd, because if you listen to any of the other characters from the Undercity, they mention the Undercity. You know, they mention top versus down. They mention the fissures. They they mention the lanes. Of course, the lanes and the fissures are practically the same thing if you look at the map that Caitlyn uses in her room. So it's like, there is no one else outside of Silco who ever calls Zon Zon. So you're just kind of like wondering, um, what is Zon? Where is it? Where did the name come from? Is it like some old name of that part of town? We don't know. There's no lore in Arcane itself. It just, it just seems kind of odd. This would be like, you only need a line or two here. <laughs> or at least, like, characters referring to the place, not as the Undercity, but as Zon. It's like, why didn't that happen? It's like, I don't know. <laughs> it's so odd. And so, there you are. When we think about, like, the different aspects of Arcane, there are, of course, areas where there are so many questions. But, you know, no... Thing is perfect and there are lots of little my small little things but as you kind of go through and even when you make your own stories is you want to kind of reduce these types of things again sometimes you have to weigh against time so if you only have a limited amount of time there's some things you may have to cut and just leave questions out but you of course want to reduce them and the thing is the better the writing is the more small things tend to stick out well so anyway if you actually have any other questions or, or things that just kind of make you go, hmm, please definitely leave them in the comments. I would love to read them. Okay, see you in the next video. Bye.